Hi, I'm Brent Stafford and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Canada is a nation unmoored from tradition and is frightened to recognize good ideas from its past. Every idea or policy must drive towards change. And not just any old change, it must be radical change. Otherwise, the action is deemed illegitimate and often even racist. The vast majority of divisive issues facing our country, such as immigration and diversity, indig indigenous rights, resource extraction, growth of government, global warming, and the redistribution of wealth, are all impacted by the imperative of radical change. Joining us today to talk about these key issues facing our country, and frankly, Western civilization, is Maxime Bernier. Bernier sorry about that, Max, the leader of the People's Party of Canada. Bernier is a lawyer, businessman, and seasoned politician, serving 13 years as a member of parliament in the Stephen Harper-led Conservative government. He's held key cabinet posts as Minister of Industry, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Minister of State. Mr. Bernier, thank you very much for joining us today on RegWatch. I'm very pleased to be with you. It's oh, an honor. Thank you very much. Now, it was only a year and a half ago that you broke away from the Conservative Party to form the People's Party of Canada. In just a few short months, you fielded an impressive 314 candidates in the 2019 federal election. Obviously, Justin Trudeau eked out a win and a minority government. Let's first jump back to election night just four months ago with some sound from your speech just to kind of cue things up here. My heart goes out to our 315 candidates across the country. They showed extraordinary courage and passion in defending our principles and policies. They did it despite nasty and shameless attacks from our opponents. What we managed to accomplish in only one year is spectacular. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians supported the People's Party today. We are the fastest growing political party in Canadian history, and we will continue to grow in the coming months and years. The issues that we raise during this election will not disappear. Unsustainable immigration, endless deficit, unfair equalization, pandering, big government policies, high taxes, all these problems will not disappear. And we will be there to criticize, criticize the government and offer better solutions. We will continue to fight for freedom, responsibility, okay. fairness, yeah. and respect. It's only okay, that's Maxime Bernier beginning. responding For to the, uh, the loss of his own seat Merci. in the post tonight and an extremely bad performance on the part of the People's Party of Canada. Well, I'll leave it to the, uh, to the CBC to put a dig in there right at the end. <laughs> that was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was a difficult night. But at the end, like I said in the speech, uh, it took 20 years and six elections for the Green Party of Canada to have more than 1.6% of the vote. And we did that in less than a year. And we were able to build a national party, not only in my own province in Quebec, but all across, all across the country. And that's why I, I, I thank all the former candidates and people who help us to build that party. And we are still doing that right now. So we'll be ready for the next election. So you mentioned principles uh, in that speech and, of course, throughout uh, the campaign. What are the principles that drive the People's Party of Canada? Yeah, these uh, principles are individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect and fairness. Uh, our <clears throat> program, our platform, our party is based on these uh, four principles and we don't do any compromise with these principles. So that's why we are doing politics differently, speaking about what we believe with passion, with conviction. And yes, uh, sometimes it is more difficult on certain subjects like climate change, but we, know, we think that we have the right ideas and the right solutions for this country, and we must explain that to the population. Yes. And uh, there's the minor little issue, too, as well, of 
uh, once a conservative, you know, heavy hitter, uh, then you ran actually for the leadership and just came really close to actually being the leader of the conservative party. And, um, and then of course you started the people's party of Canada. I've got a, a one more little bit of sound. I want to play to just to get us in. And this is some reaction, um, after, uh, Andrew Scheer had made the announcement that he was going to resign as conservative party leader. But for me, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada is not conservative anymore. Uh, I left the Conservative Party of Canada more than a year ago because they were not conservative. They were intellectually and morally corrupt, uh, and they, they didn't fight for real conservative values at the last election. So I don't think that the next leader will uh, change the thing. I think they, they want to have the same kind of policies that the Liberals uh, have right now on climate change, on deficit, on the... Uh, corporate welfare, supply management. People, the real conservatives in, in this country want to have a debate on, on real issues. And, uh, you know, that's why the People's Party is there. And, oh, uh, one second. Here we go. So, not conservative enough. What exactly yeah. does that mean? Well, <clears throat> that means that they try to please everybody and they have policies uh, you know, for Western Canada or another one for Eastern Canada. And they're doing politics like the Liberals, you know, pandering to every special interest groups. And that's not the way we are doing uh, politics. And they think that to win an election, they need to be a centrist and a pragmatic political party. But if you believe in freedom, if you believe in personal responsibility, you must speak about that. You must have policies that are in line with your principle. And for me, that's a, a right, left political party. And you just have to judge them by their platform. Yes, they will have a new leader in a couple of months from now. But for me, it won't change anything. Uh, they will do some survey and polling and try to find what the population want to hear. And they will tell them what they want to hear. And maybe after the election, if they win, they won't do anything because it's not based on conviction. I prefer to do politics based on conviction and being out there to explain our policies. And the more we speak about our policies, the better it would be for us and the better it would be for the country, the more support we'll have. And that's why I like what I'm doing. And before we get into some of the specifics that we're going to talk about today in terms of issues, still on that higher level, let's talk a little bit about how you're framed uh, in the media. When you talk about your <coughs> principles, the party's principles and these issues, now, there are a lot of Canadians who are familiar with who you are, but the picture that they have of you is very narrow, limited, and mostly uh, negative based on, you know, bigot, racist, all of these things that if you want to talk about anything in this country, you're going to get called a racist. Well, first of all, we know that uh, the Conservative Party of Canada did everything to discredit our party before the election and during the election. And as you know, they had a contract with uh, Kinsella and is uh, activist, uh, polit uh, help, is helping politi other politicians, not us, to try to find dirt or, or bad uh, behavior from the past from some politician. And that guy spent a lot of money coming from the Conservative Party of Canada to discredit our party. And he was saying to the media and to everybody that we were a racist party because we were asking for uh, fewer immigrants. And, um, and we had that debate in Quebec, actually, at the last provincial election. And the Coalition Avenir Quebec, that's the government right now, that was part of our pla of their platform to have fewer immigrants, and they won that election on that subject also. But in English Canada, that was the first time that a political party was asking for fewer immigrants, more economic immigrants, and you know solving the problem at our borders. And that's why right now I'm suing personally uh, Kinsella for defamation, and we'll see what will happen. But uh, that was very difficult for us because each time I was in from the uh, mainstream media, they were asking questions about me personally or my party to be racist. 
Uh, and, you know, I always had to explain our platform and being on the defensive on that. And I didn't have to be on the defensive. I'm not a racist. Our party is not a racist. We are just want this country to be like that in 20 years. And that's why we want to be sure that people who are coming to our country will respect our traditions, our values, and share our values. And we are uh, asking these questions during the campaign and right now. So uh, that was a tough election because of that. Yes. Now, when we talk about Canadian values, I mean, I'll put it out to you. I mean, are there such thing as Canadian values anymore? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, with Justin Trudeau, as you know, said that uh, Canada has no uh, uh, national identity and we are a post-national country, but that's not the reality. And that's the multiculturalism at the extreme. And that's why I said I'm against extreme multiculturalism. We don't need the legislation to tell us who we are as Canadian. We know who we are. We, we share the Western civilization values. And now <clears throat> that multiculturalism and political correctness it is at the extreme and you know everybody you know, everybody is different in our country and we must celebrate our diversity and i'm saying the opposite we must celebrate what unite us not the diversity of our country we know it's a diverse country and we can be proud of that but i don't i don't want the canadian government to subsidies uh, uh, the chinese community to celebrate the chinese year if they want to do that that's okay. They can do it with their own money. But the federal government must subsidize and uh, help uh, Canadians who want to celebrate our culture, our values, our Western civilization values, what unite us. And I don't know, saying that during election, it was something uh, special for some politician and the established uh, uh, media. Right, right. Well, okay, so we're going to, let's put that on the shelf for a moment, because we're going to come back to that. And I'm, obviously here at RegWatch, we've got a lot to say to add to that. We've got your back on that, Max. There's no doubt. Um, let's jump into uh, fear-mongering, because that's the biggest tool that they've got right now, and, and they're using it across everything. I mean, everything, almost every single issue that we're going to talk about, fear-mongering uh, by the progressive left is 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 de jour. I mean, that's just exactly what they do. So let's talk about coronavirus because yeah. it's being used right now uh, to achieve some certain goals in the financial markets. Uh, and what are those? What are you seeing going on with this craziness around coronavirus and the markets? But well, first of all, we must say that the way that the federal government is handling uh, that uh, subject and that file. It's not perfect, and uh, I tweeted about that. Uh, they, we must be sure in our country that we will be able to place in quarantine people coming from different regions where the uh, virus is uh, very uh, uh, is very present in some countries like China, like uh, uh, Italy and other countries like that. So the way that the government is handling that problem and dealing with that challenge, uh, for me, they're not doing what they must do. On the other side, I'm, you know, I need to laugh about that. <laughs> the financial market and, and uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada and the Fed said, you know, we will solve that and uh, we will lower interest rate and that will help that uh, crisis and the coronavirus. But for me, <clears throat> it is only a pin that may burst the bubble. We have a lot of bubble uh, in the financial market, in the bond market, in the stock market, in the uh, uh, house, housing markets. So we that has been created by central banks by printing money with low interest rate, asking people to go more into debt. And we know that you cannot become richer if you are spending money that you don't have. And, and these kind of a stimulus, they're not stimulus. It is a sedative for the economy. So what's happening right now with the coronavirus 
It's only the little pin that will burst the bubble a day. And who created these bubbles? Central banks and also governments like the Trudeau government. The, <coughs> They, they, they said, you know, we need more spending, we need more deficit, we need a huge, a bigger debt, and that will solve our problem and will create prosperity. But prosperity is not coming from government spending. It is coming from private sector investing. We need the private sector to invest. And what the Trudeau government is doing right now, <laughs> the government is doing the opposite. They are having high taxes on investment, uh, a lot of regulation. It's almost impossible right now to build uh, huge infrastructure projects in our country. And they, so they are not helping the economy, the government and the central banks. So that's why I'm a little bit worried about our future and the future generation. And if you look at the, at the data, our country is one of the most indebted country in the world. Second after um, Jap Japan, second with 300%. Our ratio to the debt to the GDP ratio, it's 300%. <laughs> you know, we it's not sustainable. Something will happen a day. And that's irresponsible right now what the federal government is doing to us and to the future generation. They won't create any wealth and jobs uh, with their economic policies. Certainly, if uh, they stand in the way of resources that they have, I mean, it's nearly $150 billion of investment capital has fled Canada uh, since this whole uh, resource fiasco, you know, has come about. And that's really, uh, you know, at the feet of the Trudeau government. Uh, absolutely. With uh, all the legislation, you know, the Bill C-16, the Bill C-48, the Bill C-69, just to explain to our to your viewers, uh, it it's uh, more regulation and that's slowing the process for an investment in natural resources in our country. And that's not an incentive for more private sector investment. And that's why we're not able to build anything in our country. But the government and also the opposition don't have the courage to use the Constitution to be sure that we'll be able to build national infrastructures in our country a day by using the Constitution. That is part of our program. We can use the Constitution, Section 9210, and saying that this project is for the national interest of our country. And when you do that, the federal government has full jurisdictions, full authority to approve a project. So the federal government won't need uh, the approval of a province, won't need the approval of any special interest group. If the federal government use the constitution, section 9210, they will have the full authority for approving any major infrastructure projects. And they don't want to use it, and the opposition don't speak about that, and it's a shame. And that's why we there's a lot of investments who are leaving our country right now. So if we have fewer investment in the near future, we'll have fewer jobs and fewer economic growth. When it comes to these protests, let's look at the Wet'suwet'en protests that are going on right now and the, all the blockades that went up. I mean, does that inflame your sense of you know justice, or, or are you like... Uh, many Canadians who believe I'm in solidarity with the hereditary chiefs, let's shut down Canada. There's a rule of law in our country and nobody must be above the law. And I'll give you an example for the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that you remember that. The Trudeau government wanted to uh, uh, put the SNC-Lavalin above the law and they tried to have a special deal with SNC-Lavalin to save a couple of hundred jobs in Montreal, to buy votes and to win his election in Montreal. I was the only politician at that time to say no special deal, no corporation is above the law. And now, a couple of months later, the <coughs> Trudeau government is saying to these people, these 
protests uh, all across the country that, you know, we won't respect the law. Uh, the law, you can do what you want to do. Uh, it's okay if, uh, you know, the population is waiting for some uh, resources that they need, like uh, gas or food or something like that. So they tolerated that for three weeks. And that's a, a very bad signal that they're saying to extremist uh, people who want to protest, come to our country, do a protest, and we'll let, we'll let you do what you want to do. There's a rule of law and everybody must be treated equally before the law. And I'm very mad, I will just finish on, on that, I'm very mad that the head of the RCMP said last week that they have a special process for uh, First Nations and the last thing that they will do is to be sure that the law will be respected. So that's coming from the RCMP, the head of the RCMP. So uh, nobody must be above the law, and that, hap that happened right now in our country. So um, federal and provincial negotiators, cabinet level, you know, sat down with the Wet'suwet'en, the hereditary chiefs, you know, banged out some kind of an agreement or, or a proposal agreement, as they said, which nobody knows what's in it. And from what we do know, it doesn't actually clear the way uh, for Coastal Gas Link, which is cleared, by the way, at all yeah. levels of government through all regulatory processes. And it's now stuck with, you know, a handful of hereditary chiefs. Um, it, I mean, is it fair to regular Canadians, to all Canadians, but let's just say regular, because the point is yeah. regular means white and male, I guess, <laughs> is, is the point being. But all Canadians, is it fair that nobody gets a say uh, in decisions like this? that are so important to the country. It seems that um, U.S. Uh, funded uh, organizations, militants, activists that come into Canada, work with Canadian groups uh, to hold these uh, projects up, they've got way more say than a Canadian does. Yeah, first of all, I must say that if you look in the Indian Act, the federal government since Confederation wrote in an act that if they have to negotiate with a First Nation, you have to elect your representative. We will only negotiate with elected representatives. And now the federal government is doing the opposite. The federal government is not respecting the Indian Act. I know that I want to abolish the Indian Act. You know, we must pass that. But, you know, <clears throat> we need to have negotiation with people who are elected and represent the people in their communities. And right now, some non-elected chief uh, uh, have all the legitimacy to deal with the government. And a couple of days in the news, the elected chiefs in that community said, we need to know, we need to know what is that uh, uh, agreement that you, you had with the federal government. So it's unfair for the elected chiefs, but imagine the, uh, the precedent that we're doing. So if another chief, you know, another uh, First Nation is saying, you know, I'm an hereditary chief and I, I, I need to speak with the federal government, so I'll do a blockade, uh, they can do it. And I don't understand why the federal government is negotiate, is having negotiation right now with people that don't represent, are not elected to represent their communities. And it's interesting too, because if you talk to Canadians that are on the progressive side, the argument that they make, and they're making it in the media, they're making it in person, they're making it over coffee and beer, is they got this out of the, the, the elected uh, uh, chiefs and council, they were shoved down the throat of uh, Aboriginal people by the federal government. And, um, you know, and that, you know, breaks all the, you know, traditional laws and everything else. Meanwhile, it was indeed a progressive notion of democracy is Absolutely. what brought that into place in the first place. And this just shows the hypocrisy and the malevolence of progressives and their, uh, and their desire to keep Aboriginal Canadians in a box as victims yeah. in which that they can exploit. And, and, yeah, and when the elected chiefs, as you may know, and as you know, they all sign 
the, the 20 uh, <coughs> elected uh, chiefs uh, with Sweden signed an agreement with the corporation to have this pipeline because they knew that it would be profitable for their communities. So they want to bring jobs to their communities and the radical left and these people say, no, no, we don't want any pipeline. Stay like that. The federal government will give you money forever. Don't do any economic development in your uh, territories. So that's, that's not the way, you know, we want them to be prosperous. We want them to be able to have a life like we have in the South here. And one way to do that is to be sure that we'll have economic, economic development in their uh, region. And now some uh, uh, non-elected chiefs are blocking that and the federal government is dancing with them. It strikes me too, uh, Maxime, that, um, that the whole uh, issue when it comes to Aboriginal affairs and much of the grievance, rightly so, that exists in terms of mistreatment should be placed where it exactly belongs. And that's on progressives. Progressives are the ones that, that said, that believe that they can make human beings into better human beings. It's progressives that have owned the education system in Canada since the 1880s. It's yeah. progressives that have manned the Depart you know, Department of Indian Affairs. It's progressives. It's government that has done this. Not, not, it's been progressives. This is a progressive program. Yeah. So progressives created the mess. Progressives have done most of the damage and then they're supposed to ride in here and everyone else is racist if we don't agree with how they want to solve it this time, which is destroying the Canadian resource economy, which is nothing less than complete leveling. Canada will be Venezuela in 10 years if we don't get back to doing what we do right. And that's resource extraction. Absolutely. And the way that the Canadian corporations are exploiting natural resources <laughs> they're doing that respecting all the legislation, provincial and federal legislation and creating jobs in Canada. So what they will do, they will go outside our country and do business outside our country. Uh, and so that's why I don't see a, a very uh, uh, bright futures, economic future for our country with all, all, the, all what the Trudeau government did to the economy and to uh, and to Canadians at the end. Would you characterize this as ideological warfare? Absolutely. You know, when you have a government that passed a legislation and said, if you want to build a pipeline, you need to have a study about the impact, the gender impact on the, the pipeline that you're building, we, you must study the impact on gender. You know, that's not economy anymore. That's socialism and that's imposing values that don't believe, don't believe in us. You know, we believe in freedom, personal responsibility, respect, fairness. But why asking a corporation to do a study on the impact of that pipeline on gender? You know, it's, 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 it's too much. Yeah, I mean, Canada is probably the home of crazy sociology. Like, if you look back, I don't know if there's ever been a time that Canadian Canada hasn't been actually screwed up. And I'll just bring this up because it's something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, the left in this country always likes to say, I remember in high school, I'm, I'm 49. <coughs> I remember in high school when I asked a, a teacher in the 80s about what does progressive mean besides progressive conservative? And the teacher, of course, is left because all teachers are. And said and made some excuse said, oh, that's just, you know, the crazy right wingers trying to pretend that they have a heart. So they put progressive in front of their name. But if you go all the way back through the history of Canada, 29 elections, you know, 24 were liberal, right? Or left. And then there's a huge chunk of six or seven that were all progressive conservatives. I, I'm, I'm of the mind now to believe, of course, that there are more progressives ever in this in this country than there's ever been conservatives. And most of the conservatives that are out there are really, truly by their name. They are progressive conservatives and they are uh, fellow travelers. But that's why, you know, I left the Conservative Party of Canada and I said the party is morally and intellectually corrupt because <clears throat> the party and the establishment of the Conservative Party of Canada is buying all that ideology of uh, 
multiculturalism, uh, uh, political uh, uh, rect rectitude. Uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, political, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're buying all that. And so they are afraid to do a real conservative reform. And, you know, but I really, I really like Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when, when she was with us and when she was in politics, she said, you know, I don't like the word consensus. You know, I prefer conviction and I'm doing politics based on conviction. And she said, my goal, because I know that I have the best ideas, is to be out there and argue. And, you know, I won't do any consensus on my principle. That was her philosophy. Now the Conservative Party of Canada is doing the opposite. It's trying to have a kind of a consensus with the radical left and yeah. try to... They think that they will be back in power, back in government sooner if they do some compromise with their ideas. And that's what they're doing right now. Yes. And what a great uh, thing to bring up there uh, with Margaret Thatcher. It, it was they say consensus, but what they really mean is capitulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's the capitulation part that's critical of that, because that's what always happens, you know. And so how do you stand up and, and fight the and fight it? It's it's brutal. So let's let's get to a particular, which is really a universal, but it is a particular, and that is climate change. Because climate change is the tool, both all rhetoric, dogma, regulation, finance, uh, I mean everything uh, falls into climate change. I actually envision I see climate change as the tool in which that the left the progressive left is reintegrating religion and the state yep. because climate change is a belief system. It's a religion. It's a dogma. It's not yep. based on fact. It, it yep. completely, totally uh, denies truth, uh, yes. wants no debate, and it has infested every aspect of, uh, of government. And, uh, and it's so, in a way, it is the secular religion and it is the merging again of, re of religion and state, which of course, that's what religion wants to do, it wants to be, be a, you know, at the levers of power. And so climate change is that. They do it by fear and the fear is immense. And I know that uh, you, uh, Max, had tweeted yesterday or the day before with regard to a story that came out in the UK, uh, children are having nightmares about climate change with one in five saying they are losing sleep over the environmental crisis survey reveals. It's over 2,000 children in the UK. That's a significant number. Uh, from 8 to 16, nearly 80% said the problem is very important to them. Um, and uh, at least two in five do not trust adults to tackle the issues. This is, you know, the results of a decade or two of massive propaganda. And it's now taking root inside with our kids and when they're in their twenties and thirties, I mean, is there any hope? I think it is, you know, <clears throat> people will realize that the climate is always changing and there's no climate emergency, but what they're doing to kids and people telling them, you know, it would be the end of the world if we don't do anything, uh, we must be out there. And we, when I'm saying we, uh, the People's Party and me as a politician, we have a responsibility to be out there and to speak. And, you know, I was very pleased to be in British Columbia uh, just before the election. And I did an event with Patrick Moore. And I want to do a little bit more of that. Uh, we need people speaking out there. And, you know, I was the first one to say we won't sign the Paris Accord. We won't impose a carbon tax. We won't impose a new regulation on businesses. But the Conservative Party of Canada, <laughs> that's part of their platform. More regulation. Yes, no carbon tax, but more regulation. And they believe in the Paris Accord. So you have to be out there to explain that. And it's a little bit sad that kids are drinking the Kool-Aid and, uh, you know, believe in, in that. But that's why we need to be out there. We're a minority and we need to be out there. And the more we, we will explain the situation to the population, the better it would be. And uh, that's, as a politician, I think that's one of my responsibility 
to be out there. And I tweeted also uh, about uh, Greta and all the, the things that she said. And a lot of people at that time said, Maxime, you know, it's only a kid. Yes, maybe she's, uh, she's now <clears throat> she's an adolescent, uh, but, you know, she's the face of that movement. And, and I was speaking and arguing with her because I'm uh, <laughs> because she believes in that and I don't. So we need to 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 be part of that. I won't say uh, yes to something that I don't believe. And so that's why it was important to be out there and against uh, uh, radical leftists and radical environmentalists. And it's too bad what's happening with uh, our children right now. Yeah, absolutely. It you can't. It's hard to un. It's hard to undo the brainwashing that's happened um, here. Now, I want. I I know that we're mindful of our time, but I wanted to do this because I have not yet had a chance to do this in any of our coverage. This is the Paris Agreement. Um, I'm right up here on uh, the UN site. So this is the Paris Agreement, United Nations, 2015 cover page. Second page is blank. Third page is the Paris Agreement. So these are all the parties to this agreement, right? So, so already, before you've gotten into anything, okay, you're dealing with, uh, you, we need, you know, an effective and progressive response, right? Yeah. We need, uh, there, you know, there's going to be special circumstances. Uh, then we need to have equitable access to sustainable development and eradication of poverty. What the hell does that have to do with keeping the ocean temperatures down? And then yeah, it yeah. starts getting crazy. Uh, safeguarding food security. I mean, that's a leftist policy. Food security is a radical leftist policy. And then ending hunger. So ending hunger worldwide is, is, a, is, is on page two of climate change. Then you really get into it. Acknowledging that climate change is a common concern of humankind, parties should, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations on human rights. The right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, and the right to develop, as well as gender equality, empowerment of women, and intergenerational equity. This is communism. This, should, this is not about climate. This is not about science. This is page two of the Paris Accords. And if anybody with a brain reads this, They'd realize this is an ideological document. It's not science, and it's poison. And that's why they don't want any debate because they know that if we debate and uh, and bring that forward to the population, people understand that. So they're saying each time we want to. Oh no no, there's no debate. You know the climate is changing. It's important, and everything that's the uh, that uh, that is in the Paris Accord. It's uh, it's religion, like you said, but thanks for what you're doing. It's important. People must know, must know that. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you for what you're doing. So let's move to another particular, um, and that is about vaping. We've been covering this issue yeah. now for four years. Reg Watch is one of the top uh, news organizations in the world on that. The Director General of the Tobacco Control Directorate of Health Canada, two of them have sat down with Reg Watch to talk about these issues. Clearly in the media, uh, they've got... They've got a hard on for vaping is the best way to put it. Thank God we're on online here so I can say words like that. Um, what do you think about vaping, Maxim? What do you know about it as an issue? Well, I don't know a lot about it, but, you know, I can apply our principles. You know, it's an industry. It's a legal industry. So I don't understand why the federal government and the provincial government are doing everything to kill that industry by regulations. And I know that if you look at the study, if you are uh, using their products, it is better than uh, using a cigarette and then smoking. So why the regulatory uh, establishment in Ottawa is against that industry, you'll tell me, but I don't understand. Well, partly, I mean, it's a public health thing and public health are progressive. So it, within public health, they've got this huge desire to control what people do. And so it's one of the mechanisms in which that they can, you know, regulate behavior. Um, the other thing, too, is that they've got a real problem with people who um, enjoy individual pleasures. 
So there's an individual pleasure that somebody has with their use of nicotine. Uh, yeah. And they, and now, unless it's tobacco where, where they've got that fully in control, like the mafia does, um, you know, the vaping is out of their hands. And plus two, I do believe that they have a very, very strong disgust for the success in which that the commercial success in which these companies have had from small to big, because it's an industry that just popped up in over 10 years. It's, it's the free market and consumers solving a problem that, um, that is a real, pro a life and death problem that the government has not been able to solve. And they did it without the government spending $1. And so yeah. I always look at the whole uh, tobacco issue with smoking is a growing government issue. They don't really yeah. want to stamp smoking totally out because, you know, they get their tax money and it grew government. So yeah. um, they look at vaping and they go, well, how can vaping help grow government or replace tax dollars? And it's not so easy. So instead they demonize it and they move to kill it. Yeah. And it's, uh, I hope that with your work and, uh, the uh, the work of other people in the industry uh, i hope they would be able to convince some politicians that you know don't don't do anything it's a free market you must have more freedom and people at the end are responsible so they're responsible for their health they're responsible for what they're doing so if they want to use that product they must be able to do that you know now <laughs> we are able to buy cannabis uh, all across the country and it would be maybe in a day more difficult to uh, buy some of uh, their products. I don't understand the logic there. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, as a you know politician who's been around for a long, long time, and I don't mean that as an old, I mean, you know, you've been there, done that. 13, 13 years, but I was in the private sector before. Uh, I know what it is to, to work in the private sector. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I've got a little surprise for you coming up based on, based on that. Um, just on this last thing, it, it's around vaping, but it's not. This is this is actually much bigger, but it's the it's the ammunition that's used in your mind. Um, as a politician, what is the pressure like coming from outside special interest groups with regard to issues around saving the children? Are you familiar with that? I mean, like, is that something that's in the halls of Parliament a lot, or or is it esoteric? No, you can use all the arguments when you want to bring a new regulation in, in Parliament. And you're saving the world for climate change, saving the kids for, for uh, vaping. And so, but you must look at the facts and uh, the government, uh, you know, is there for the security of, of the population and not to regulate everything in your day to day life. And so, uh, I, I, I'll give you an example from myself. When, when you're a minister, you have the pressure from your civil servant to, that they, they will bring more regulation because they want to have uh, more control and, and, and they will be more important. So they're bringing solution and the solution, it's always more regulations. And you have the journalists and, uh, and, and, and the, the public that is asking for some time and action from the politician. So it's easy for a politician to say yes to the civil servant and they will be able to do a press conference and saying, you know, I'm working very hard for that cause and blah, blah, blah. But <coughs> you must explain why sometime and most of the time you don't need the government to solve a problem and uh, that's why, you know, we need a smaller government, not a bigger government. But there's a lot of pressure for these politicians. And uh, the best compliment I receive is when I was industry minister. Uh, <clears throat> uh, somebody told me that he had a meeting with my uh, civil servant, the head of the industry department. And he said, you know, Maxime, <coughs> sorry about that. I don't like what I'm hearing from you because I spoke to your deputy minister and he said that you are not listening to your civil servant and I think it's not good for your reputation. I said, no, that's great. He's right. I'm not always listening to the civil servant. You know, <laughs> the, I'm the politician, I'm the minister, and I will have to decide on different uh, files. But for me, 
you know, you need to have an idea. And each time I was looking at a file, for me, I wanted to have more freedom, less government. I wanted to go in that direction. But the civil servant didn't want to go in that in that direction. So that was a compliment when that civil servant said to a person that Bernie is not listening to us. Yeah, you're right. Uh, a lot of time, a lot of the time I was not listening to them because they wanted a bigger government. Oh, uh, that they always want bigger government. Uh, yeah. So I've got you for another five minutes or so, right? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so bear with me on this and you can definitely have the drink of water. What I'm going to do for everybody here, I didn't get a chance to put this into a Chiron, but I'm going to read here about 90 seconds of, of something. I'm not going to tell you by who. I'm not going to yeah. tell you when it was written <clears throat> and I'm just going to read it and then let's have a quick chat about it. So here it is. All right. So this is about socialism and socialists, and they want a distribute. They want a redistribution of wealth. Of course, a just distribution replaces an unjust distribution of goods. Want and misery vanish, and there is wealth for all. A picture of paradise is unfolded before us. A paradise which, so the laws of historical evolution tell us, we, or at least our heirs, must at length inherit. For all history leads to that promised land, and all that has happened in the past has only prepared the way for our salvation. This is how our contemporaries see socialism, and they believe in its excellence. It is, it is false to imagine that the socialist ideology dominates only those parties which call themselves socialist, or what is generally intended to mean the same thing, quote, social, quote. All present-day political parties are saturated with the leading socialist ideas. Even the stoutest opponents of socialism fall within its shadow. They, too, are convinced that the socialist economy is more rational than the capitalist, that it guarantees a more, that it guarantees a more just distribution of income, that historical evolution is driving man inexecurably sorry, in that direction. When they oppose socialism, they do so with the sense that they are defending selfish private interests and that they are combating a development which from the standpoint of public welfare is desirable and is based upon the only ethical acceptable principle. And in their hearts, they are convinced that they're resistant, that any resistance is hopeless. So does that sound familiar? <laughs> Yes, I, it's, uh, I don't know what you were reading. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we are is, there right now. This yeah. is actually the book. This is Ludwig von Mises, and I know you're a big Mises fan. Yeah, Lud yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is literally, he wrote the book on socialism, called Socialism. And yeah. what he was writing there, he wrote in 1919. 1919, and, and it describes today. Yeah, and we are there today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I like Mises, I like uh, Rothbard and Hayek, and I think it's important. I, people must uh, have a chance to go on the Mises.com website. It's a very good website. It's all about uh, <clears throat> the economy. It's all about uh, human being. It's all about the uh, capitalism. And, you know, pe politicians are, are afraid to speak about our system it's a capitalist system but that's a great system and oh you know tomorrow they're going to say if you have a recession it's because of capitalism it's because of the free market so we need more intervention but uh, Mises was right and uh, i think we are right to fight for more freedom and less government well and that's true and and uh, one of the big things for me and it, you know the big universal is that one of the reasons why progressives destroy history, they don't teach it, they yeah. rewrite it, and what they can't do that to, then they have to destroy by calling it racist. Or yeah. if you read it, you're a racist, and so forth. They apply the, pro the problematic lens to history for the stuff they can't destroy or rewrite, then it becomes problematic, and then they move it you know, out, out of the teaching. The reason why they do that is because socialists and progressives and their deeds are littered throughout time. And when you read something written in 1919 by one of the leading world's leading economists, and he's describing the, the way in which a socialist thinks, and it describes a person progressive today, yeah. well, they can't afford to let that be seen no. by some 15-year-old or, you know, even 25-year-old or whatever, because it just, it belies then the lie 
that uh, that there's this you know thing marching forward for ever better change. When the fact of the matter is, is that human beings are flawed, and progressives are some of the biggest flawed people ever. We need more people like you speaking about that. Well, and we can we can all we can leave it at that. So, uh, Maxine, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today on Reg Watch. Really appreciate it. What's next for the party? And then I'll let you go. But the next, <clears throat> we are starting to rebuild the party after the election. And the most important for us is to be ready for the next election. And we'll select some candidates this year. And our goal is to have a full slate of candidates, but also I'm traveling across the country, speaking about our values and our principles. I will be out west in a couple of weeks from now. But the most important also, I have a show. We call that the, Ma <laughs> the Max Bernier Show. Uh, every week, speaking up on a subject, it will be the economy this week. And at the same time, I'm having an interview with one of our guests and uh, I will have a uh, uh, Salim Mansour that will come with us having a discussion on uh, multiculturalism and the radical left. That would be very interesting. As you know, uh, Salim wrote a book on uh, multiculturalism a couple of years ago. So the Max Bernier show is there to promote the freedom ideas and we use the social media and I'm very pleased that I had the opportunity to be with you and that's our goal. Speaking about what we believe with passion, with conviction, traveling across the country, using the social media. And I think at the end, we'll be able to be, be successful in a couple of months from now. Well, you make sure you keep us posted and you're welcome back on our show anytime. And if you're in Vancouver, stop by our studio. I will, I will for sure. Well, thank you, Maxine. Just hang on tight one second there. Well, that's it, everyone, for this edition of RegWatch. Before you head off, please go over to support.regulatorwatch.com at support.regulatorwatch.com and consider making a financial contribution to our coverage. It's easy. Just dig into your wallet and find a few dollars and then toss them our way. You'll be happy you did, and so will we. And while online, don't forget to like us on Facebook and then follow us on Twitter. For regulatorwatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.